Through a Scottish Prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish Prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy. Hi folks, welcome back to Through a Scottish Prism. Great to have you back. I hope you and yours are well. Um, it's been a heck of a week. A heck of a week. And we have got quite a lot to talk about. Um, so we'll not stand on ceremony. Let's get them in. Um, and we'll immediately start, of course, with our favourite lawyer up there in Click Manage. Hi, Eva, my friend, how are you? Hi, Roddy. I'm in good night today, thanks. We're obviously recording on International Women's Day, and to celebrate, I'm having what is actually a wee cup of tea in the mug that the Fourth Valley mm -hmm. Feminist gave me a couple of weeks ago um, oh. when we had a day together in Falkirk. So, as you know, I continue, like you, to say that a woman is an adult human female, and today, of all days, is one when we should be repeating that because too many people have forgotten that that's what we ought to be living by. Yeah, I'm drinking water. Hmm. As Ricky Fulton said, your water's great. Um, and over there in Edinburgh, in old Ricky, we have our favourite Lloyd. How are you doing? <laughs> I, I, will, really I forgot to say weatherman, but what can I tell you? I'm well. I'm very well. Good. Excellent. Great to see you again. And back from Dakota, the Coatbridge Cavalier is back in Coat de Brig. Mr. Yeah. Boswell, how are you? All right, troops. <laughs> back in time for the for the, the tour, eh? The old, it Aye, be magic. Should be a hoot, man. Should be a laugh. Oh, so, and you're goodness. arriving Sunday, so there may be trouble ahead. Yes, I worry about that. I do worry about that. Um, and can I just say before we bring in our mystery guest, um, or our mysterious guest, I don't know what to call him. Um, I should just say, state that no one has won the pen yet for finding we Peter Morell. We still haven't seen them. We don't have any photographic evidence. It's also been brought to my attention that not only is we Petey missing, but it turns out that Kate Middleton, the Princess of Wales, is missing too. Now, I'm not going to start a rumour, but, you know, you know me and coincidences, folks. You know me and coincidences. And so let's bring in our mystery guest. He's back. He's in his dressing room, but he's back. It's the old Paisley Mohawk himself. With the stress on old Mr. Lawson, welcome back. Yes, I'm here for a festive frolic just a couple of months away, but there you go. There we well, go. Welcome, Mr. Nice to have you here, Ian. I'm very reassured. Phil hasn't lost his accent, he still sounds as if he comes from Coat Bridge. That's got to be a positive sign. Well, I, I've got to tell you this, you know, I need your opinion on this. We're doing a tour, as you know, the prison's going on tour, and we're. We put out some flyers and things. Take it, goodness, you stick up the flyer for next week's uh, show in Dundee. What is going on with that hair, Ian? Tell me. Look at uh, that's that. Well, that's, mm -hmm. that's a first offender's photograph I've ever seen one. <laughs> he's, he's probably got suede shoes on and a cardian under his left arm. <laughs> were, were you doing an Alvin Stardust impersonation <laughs> show or something? Tell us what, what was going on there, Phil. Oh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it was just a bad year day, I guess, and I was advised not to, not to. Uh, what is it? Where I was a blue and black herringbone, uh, long coat with a suede collar, and it was just I thought it was a damn fine. I know in, in Coatbridge it was a damn fine impersonation of Alan Bastard. I thought myself, but uh, maybe the wrong, the wrong, the, the wrong way to go. I guess wrong I, I live to regret tone. it because here it comes again. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, as our guest, Ian, I'd like to kick off with you, if I may. It's been a heck of a week for the grassroots movement. The grassroots seems to be, and, and you know, you're based now more in the grassroots than certainly than the mainstream, like, like the rest of us now. Um, you, you've been watching from outside. What have you made of this, you know, the upsurge in what's happening? Well, I don't think it's just happened this week, Roddy. I mean, the, the, the direction of travel for quite a number of months, if not years, has been people moving away from political parties. It's quite clear that folk are fed up to the teeth with political parties largely 
you know, because they've made no progress or shown e any inclination to even try to make some progress. So it's not a surprise that the grassroots are saying, enough's enough. We've got to look for new direction, new methods. And of course, that's what you had Eva uh, and... Uh, uh, Sally. So, sorry, Sally Hughes, you know, making their moves. And I mean, it had a big impact. There's no doubt about it. I noticed oh, yes. on Twitter, on Facebook, on my blog, lots and lots of people were very, very happy about that happening and saw mm -hmm. it in a, as an advance. And I mm -hmm. confidently forecast there'll be more independence for independence arriving on the scene between mm -hmm. now uh, and I would forecast the end of April. You know, so I think that, you know, people people are taking it into their own hands. And I think there's a great opportunity there because uh, Eva, for instance, knows that area very, very well. And if I was Eva, I would be putting a survey out and asking people about their views and a whole range of issues. And then when it comes to the general election, well, the ALBA party, the SNP, the Tories, Labour, all stand in their manifestos. I think Eva should run on your manifesto because you've consulted with the people in that area. You've got what they want done and you run in those issues and let them know that you're doing it because you're taking them into account. And I think you'll do very well. I agree with you. I think you'll do very well. And when we're talking that, Ryan says about people being happy, there's a lot of people unhappy. And you just notice, folks, when we, we come on, you'll notice that our sponsorship is removed. Um, and we want to thank them for the last 11 months or so of uh, sponsorship. Um, they decided, um, out of the blue, I've got to say, a few days prior to that, they were talking about funding our Prism Roadshow trip, but they pulled out overnight uh, with just the words telling us that they could no longer support us. And it was the same day that we published a blog on EVA standing as an independent. And... Um, we, we can only assume um, it was because of this. Um, and we have heard, I don't know if it's true, political leverage was used to do that. But I tell you what, the point is that here uh, on, on PRISM, we will continue to bring you the stories. We don't make the news. We bring and review the news. And if some people don't like that and don't like the truth and the news and the reality, then I'm hell of a sorry, but we're going to keep doing it, no matter what anyone says or does or tries to do to us. We are here to tell you, I mean, we'll leave the lying and the hiding of stuff to the BBC and ITV and the media. We won't do it, no matter what anyone does this, and we will find a way around. However, we will find ourselves somehow or other. Anyway, that's enough of that. But we thank them for their efforts for the last 11 months, and uh, we'll enjoy the equipment they bought for us. You will be all enjoying it this month as we tour the country. Um, but don't worry, we will not be going away. We won't break a promise to you. We will attend all the prisms we said we would. Anyway, on that note, Phil, the grassroots stuff, what have you made? You've just arrived back and you've landed and it's all taken off in big big style. Although, as, as Ian points out, not, you know, it's not brand new, but it's really taken flight. Yeah, and I think the <coughs> Ian's right. I agree with what Ian said, the, the grass movement grassroots movement is growing and the mainstream parties are are upset by it and certainly probably should be running scared because what we're doing is we're seeing the grassroots uh, come back into its own as it did in 2014 remember that strategy let's be honest pretty much designed by Alex and the SNP was that we create a grassroots movement that leads the initiative towards independence that drives the initiative of, of independence and nothing less. And it, it, it left, I think, quite a lot of politicians surprised at just how much catching up they had to do with the will of the people. Now, that that is what we want to see again. And this is why we are doing what we're doing, because we're just not seeing enough from the political parties, as Ian has mentioned already. And it does. But, and and the, the, the problem is, you know, we're looking at the, the Greens that have declared they're going to fight for more Westminster seats. And then, as you mentioned earlier, Roddy, uh, uh, maybe before we were on air, that this this nobody mentions it, but that's splitting the indie vote. You know, and uh, two indie candidates declare and uh, all, suddenly all hell all breaks loose. So this does split the indie vote. 
which is why a unifying yes movement like Scotland United or anything like that, which allows independence parties to openly collaborate, is so essential. That's what we did in 2014. That's why we came so close to winning. And while in 2014, SNP were the only independence party, that con that cannot be said. In fact, they were, they were an independence party. That cannot be said for the SNP since Nicola took over the reins. And now with the bozos in charge, they are not giving the people of Scotland what we require. An independent nation that can look after itself, feed itself, care for itself. And as Sally Hughes said when she was on the Midweek Independence for Independence show earlier this week, she said independence means we can turn the heating back on. You know, that really stuck in the, the, the head there. And um, the problem is now is the SNP not only have no clear plan to gain Indy and have made zero progress, as Ian mentioned earlier, towards Indy since Nicola was handed the keys to freeing our country. And because of this need, a swift kick in the chuckies at the next election to focus the SNP's attention is what's required and make the party get rid of its current leadership and those who want devolution. Independence, nothing less. That's what's required. So don't vote SNP this time round. Instead, vote for any other independent supporting candidate from any other party. And it's, for me, one of three. It's Alaba, ISP, or the independents for independence candidates like Eva Comrie and Sally Hughes. Plus, to be honest, anyone you like that is pro-independence, but not the current SNP, which has betrayed its prime director of independence, nothing else. I, ISP, I think, are going to really struggle again. And if Alapa play it right, because they, they, for me, are in, 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 in more of a driving seat. Um, but it does come down to individuals. And Eva Comrie and Sally Hughes are extremely strong candidates. And if I was in either of their constituencies that they're running and that they, they, these two women would be I'd be voting for you know one of them wherever I was and if I'll be coming for Coat Bridge put forward a good candidate a strong candidate such as my buddy Rab Slavin then that's who I will be voting for here in the brig no, I don't blame you I would support uh, Rab Slavin every day of the week and a lot of other good people absolutely absolutely I'm not just because I'm no longer party political doesn't mean I'll support people who are in favour of independence um, uh, Lloyd, I, I'm, I'm having a problem with the, the chat to be able to send messages to Teki to tell him what I want. But Teki, can you stick up uh, the article about uh, Lorna Slater and the red line? There you go. Not a red line to deal with Labour. The reason I put this up is from last year, Lloyd. Mm. But the, the announcement that Phil alluded to there, that uh, you know, the the Greens intend to stand in more seats than ever. They stood in 22 seats in 2019 and they intend to do that. And it goes back to this standing independence. Nothing was said. No one has complained. But as soon as we put, as soon as we find two independents step forward, suddenly it's a disaster. Suddenly it's a problem. Suddenly, you know, it's the worst thing you could do to the independence movement. And the political parties send out their attack dogs. They complain, they gurn, they moan, talk about all sorts of things. Why was there silence when it was the Greens? Because they are all on the same page. But, you know, I'd, I'd like to say something really straightforwardly here. There is really nothing of any interest to me and other activists here about the sniping and undermining of independence candidates by so-called independent supporters in any of the political parties. This is an expression, this is happening because of the ineptitude of the Scottish National Party and their failure to deliver in 10 years the desires and wishes of the people. The fact that there is a somewhere between a 13 and a 16% difference between support for the Scottish National Party and support for independence tells you why this movement is happening. People are drifting from the SNP because of inaction. And the fact that any, any independent supporter would see that people standing would split the vote, ask yourself a question. Exactly why are people standing? Whose vote are they splitting? If you don't vote for the SNP, have you abandoned independence? I do not think so. It's never been that case throughout my entire life. What is happening here is the movement is beginning to is beginning to exercise its muscle. And that's a good thing. It's a democratic thing. These are false, mm -hmm. entirely straw man arguments, the, the arguments of splitting the vote. If it wasn't a, 
Alba will split the vote when Alba was actually offering a Scotland United approach, which would have led us to uh, a, a hefty pro-independence majority in the, the last parliament, but they chose not to do that. They can say nothing about anybody, but the fact is, if 25 years ago, when the parliament was first formed, some of the smarter people in the SNP had spent some time looking at how devolution had affected the independence parties and movements in other countries in Europe, they might have discovered ways and means which would have allowed us not to spend an extra 25 years as part of the British Union, but maybe have found the barricades and blockages that have been put in, out in front of us were able to be defeated and overcome by people in other places. But more importantly, for those who weren't able, able to overcome these things, we would have been better prepared for what has been put in front of us, but no one did that work. So what's happening now is the people, the people are expressing themselves in a very particular way. And if the parties don't like it, and I have to say that the SNP rebrand of sticking the word independence under the logo is no rebrand. If any of these youngsters knew anything, the one thing they would understand is that over 80 years of campaigning, the one thing that the electorate of Scotland know about the Scottish National Party and perplexes them somewhat at the moment is it stands for independence. Unfortunately, we know they don't. Uh, Eva, you, you know, you've been the centre of everything this week. It's the centre of a storm, the centre of adulation, more positive than negative. Um, has it, have you been surprised at some of the people on our own side who have been, you know, you've had quite a, a few attacking you as well. That must have been quite distressing. No, I don't care. They can attack me as much as they want. It's water off a duck's back because I've done what I've done because I thought it was the right thing to do and because I'm putting country before party, and I believe that that's what very many other people, as Ian said, will do. Um, so I don't care who wants to criticise me by whatever method. Um, my conscience is clear and it will remain so. Um, those who actually know me know perfectly well that my driver is independence for our country, unless, and my view, and I know not so many people believe me at the moment, or, or not so many agree with me, my view is that we could make the general election the independence election if politicians, leaders, civic leaders and the general public who favour independence get behind a united campaign. We shouldn't have to wait until 2026 or to some you know, fabled, collapsed earlier Holyrood election. That's not what any of the current politicians who were elected on an independence ticket are supposed to do. They're supposed to look after their people. And if people don't like it, that's just tough. They'll either vote for me and Sally and some other independents for independence, or they won't. But our ambition is to take Scotland forward, and I would like nothing better than to see the result of the general election being a majority of seats for independence supporting candidates and particularly a majority of the popular vote supporting independence candidates because then we've got a double whammy that is internationally recognised and instead of going to Westminster to cause hassle, we'd be sitting in Edinburgh hammering out how to negotiate the best settlement for Scotland and take the country through towards Independence Day and the freedom that we deserve and then to start to rebuild. Yeah, while you're here, I want to ask you another question. I'm going to give you two questions, Eva, because it's Friday night. Um, Teki, can you stick up the, the Grangemouth um, main core thing? Now, I'll, it's funny, this wasn't discussed. I know you're, you're dead when the NEC up until a week ago. You don't know, I don't know if you know anything about this. It's suddenly no. become a main block, and a main policy for Grangemouth. It's going to be at the centre of the Alaba Party uh, campaign, and they're going to get this in every ballot paper. They hope Grangemouth must stay open or whatever they're saying. But this is just... Is this, did this happen after, or did you know about this before you, you left the NEC? I'm not surprised that Grangemouth would be at the centre of the campaign because that's what any sensible Scot would want to be, and mm. Alex certainly prioritises Scotland's needs. So, no, that doesn't surprise me. I'm a bit surprised about the ballot paper issue, though. Um, I didn't know about that at all. Um, so, yeah, that, that one is a surprise. I'm not, I'm not sure if I, I agree with that or not, actually. Hmm. Okay. Um, on that, um, Ian, you've been heavily involved with Salvo and Liberation on the Free Force. 
And it's something that is a huge danger to Scotland and the Scottish people, which I'm afraid our media, again, is not actually giving it the coverage that it should. And I know you guys have been working flat out. Techie, can you stick up the new guy that's arrived and was heralded as a big uh, capture for the Alaba party? This is a guy who's one of the runners, one of the guys right behind the Cromartery uh, making it a freeport. You know, Alba Party, when I was in it until a couple of weeks ago, were opposed to freeports. It kind of sends out the wrong message, is not when you're taking on a guy who's actively working to get a freeport. Have they changed their policy? Well, I mean, it, it was surprising, let's just say that, that they, they made such a big fuss of it. Because I'm quite convinced the vast majority of Scots are against freeports, the more so when they find out about them. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, why not, no information about freeports is in the mainstream media. You know, it's a bit like Salvo Liberation. It's toxic, uh, you know, for the, for these freeports. For Scots, they know what they mean. Just in the same way as Salvo Liberation is toxic to the union. Uh, and they're all, we're also blanked by the media for that reason, because we're dangerous. I mean, the real point of freeports is that there's a whole range of reasons why we, we should be against them. First of all, they're taking two large swathes of the Scottish economy and stripping it out of the Scottish economy and putting it under direct Westminster control. They're also taking the taxes that are currently raised in those two large swathes uh, and removing that from Scotland as well, because, of course, it's going to be tax-free in these areas. And there's no mention of the damage it does in the neighbouring areas outside, where they're going to purloin jobs and factories moving and all the rest of it into these particular zones where regulation is going to be much more loose. You know, so, you know, it's just another example of Westminster taking control of parts of Scotland. But the really worrying thing about this is the Scottish government's doing nothing to stop them. You know, they're, they're supposed to be elected to look after Scotland's interests. Scotland's interests are certainly not free ports. In fact, if you look at the control of our ports, never mind free ports, and how they're run, and run down deliberately and intentionally, own from outside Scotland, and they're run down to protect the other assets of these same companies that are situated south of the border. So, I mean, it's economic suicide to go down this route, and it's loss of economic, political, and economic uh, and commercial power of these areas, which were transferring under London's authority rather than Scotland. I, you know, they can frack in these areas, as an example. The moratorium that's in Scotland for the rest of Scotland is blown apart by these free port areas. If they want to start fracking there, it'll be perfectly legitimate because Scotland, Scottish government no longer has control of those areas. So it's disastrous. And if I just very quickly go back to the first question, I'm enthused about what's happening with the grassroots because I've been through this before. I witnessed it in Estonia, where because of PR, there was a whole range of different political parties and they all had a different answer to how Estonia was going to get its independence. And of course, they were all competing for the votes of Estonians who all wanted independence. But that just created a logjam. And what happened was the people took control. The people decided what they would do to get their independence. It was called the singing revolution, but no one, no political figure, no matter how important, could ignore it. They either had to get on board the people's vehicle or get left behind. And of course, they all eventually united around this people's movement and they delivered independence. And that's what we've got to do here in Scotland. It's as simple as that. There is no way of doing it through the political party system because they've always got to argue with each other because they're chasing your vote. Whereas yeah. the way we are doing it, we can unite people and become much more powerful than any single political party. That's the route to go. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, the people I've spoken who are going independent and all the different things, and yourself, Sarah, no, no one's got any personal political ambitions. 
the exactly. only ambitions they've got are for their nation. And that's what we need, folks. Um, Phil, on three ports, where are you? Oh, mute. Here's a quid. Well, there you go. Steve Chisholm, who's the guy you featured earlier in the art article, is described as a driving force behind Freeports for Cromarty. Joining Alba to much fanfare, does that signal that Alba like the SNP about to embrace Freeports? Yes, it does. Against, and, and that shouldn't be the case. Um, this is a Highland Energy boss who was going to be an SNP Westminster candidate, quit and joined Alba. Um, and he's a Highland that you know he's Highland Energy boss and um, pushed really pushed the Cromarty for green Freeport. What that actually means, nobody really knows. But he works as the Operations and Innovations Director of the Global Energy Group, one of the biggest employers in the North. And his role involves coordinating the public bodies' task of developing a business case for the Freeport. So outside of his job. Uh, he's been a, a, a long-time supporter of SNP, but he's a man of independence mind, which is probably why he's moved from SNP, who, are, who have been in the doldrums uh, for, since Nicola took over. Um, and he's now moved to Alapa because you can see that Alex is doing more about it, or the Alapa seem to be doing more about it. Just exactly how much more we've yet to see, but... The, what we're about to find out, I should hope. And he's this is his family's long been involved, but on free ports, um, I, I there's one thing, and this is with Sal, we're really useful, and our old friend uh, Alf Beard, Professor Alf Beard, read his alt article in the Salvo website. You know, what do you know about free ports? They're more than just a port, they're designed, they're designated areas. And they're usually very, very large, and they cover land and sea. Now, Kate Forbes has backed this. She pushed Michael Gove to bring two free ports to Scotland, one in Inverness and the Cromarty Firth, and the other one, uh, but it goes all the way out to Brora, and the other one, of course, is in Edinburgh. But it's like the other, the other fourth free port. It's half a fife, you know, and approximately 70% of Edinburgh, Falkirk and Grangemouth. The boundary width is nearly 45 kilometres. Or 28 miles, and 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 the more as the more details creep out, we need to be announcing dates, you know, and we we should be going to public meetings about this. And more credit to Salvo for doing just that, because they can be a good thing if the legislation in place. And I'm now going to quote Alf Alf Baird's words because he's the expert on this. If the legislation is in place to serve the community, they're a good. They can be a good thing. And the operators invest in the community through creating jobs, improving infrastructure, if they operate within the law of the state or the country that they're in. But what is being imposed, Alf says, is not that. The free ports uh, um, do not have to adhere to employment laws, including minimum wages, national insurance and pensions contributions, and health and safety laws. They're free to avoid environmental laws. Who regulates the, the free ports isn't clear. There'll be little or no benefit to the local community, and there's no obligation to return regional investment to local communities. Tax and customs and excise laws have been relaxed. Who knows what will be coming and going? Will they become tax havens? It's happened in the past, and in, and given it's the Tories that are putting it in place, it's going to happen again. So the Scottish government has insisted there'll be green free ports. Define that. What does that actually mean? How can they be regulated when they're operational? They'll be sub will they be subject to Scots law, the UK Government Internal Market Act 2020? And this is, again, Alf Bear's words. He's the expert on this, and that's who we should be listening to. So more power to him. So the model of free ports favoured by the UK government is not the preferred model across Europe. They serve big business, not the local community or the people. So free ports, Alf asks in his final one of his questions, free for who? Exactly. Um, Lloyd, you and I did a programme with Alf and uh, I think you were on that programme, I think with Councillor, Councillor Brown down in Teesside and Alf about the free ports and the stories from Teesside and folks, I'm, I'm going to put it, I'll, I'll put it in a, you know, you'll see it in the blog and it, along the, in the description, that particular episode, but it was a horror story from Teesside, all the promises that we're getting in Scotland about creating jobs and Lots of this, that, and the next thing. And all that happened was that jobs that were outside the Freeport moved into the Freeport, and people, as Phil was pointing out, lost their, their, their rights and their, their, their ability to be in a trade union, all sorts of things. And it's cost a fortune. 
and no, there's no local benefit. Absolutely not. In fact, uh, what happened in Teesside was it was robbery. Straightforwardly, it, the people of the area were robbed, absolutely robbed blind. The total area which covers the whole of the the the, the docks at, at, at Teesside, which were previously owned by the people, were sold by the local council for a nominal mm -hmm. £100. Pounds. Yeah. Within the boundaries of the land they sold for £100 pounds to three particular individuals was £10 million pounds in scrap steel. For £100, pounds, three individuals got £10 million pounds that belonged to the people of Teesside. Now, I know Leith Docks very well, and there's easily... £20 million pounds worth of scrap steel lying about in the unused areas of Leith Docks. And Leith Docks are the focal centre of the Freeport. Along with, of course, our airport, which is now owned by BlackRock. But, you know, let's step back a wee bit. The current British Prime Minister is, uh, uh, is, a, is, 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 is entirely and completely committed to the concept of absolute free trade but also committed through the guru that uh, the Freeport guru who taught him at university is committed to breaking the European Union by using Britain as a giant Freeport to undermine the European Union. And combined with that is, and you know, join the dots, do one in one. Jim Radcliffe is just about to be given 700 million pounds to build a refinery in Antwerp in the European Union. And the whole thing that's happening here is an, an attempt to undermine the European Union from the outside, which is the core value of the Brexiteers. The Brexiteers didn't just want to pull out of the European Union because of their post-imperial mentality. They wanted to pull it down. And this is the way that they believe they can do it. But they also believe that they can restore Britain's economy by directly challenging the European Union in this manner. These three ports, would they have happened or even been considered if the British Isles were still part of the European Union? No, they wouldn't have, because there's a different purpose at, at work here. It's about undermining the European Union's market in itself. And for us, the corollary to that is, is preventing us from being a viable unit as an independent country. That ultimately is the message from the free ports. We as a country, without control, particularly of our oil and gas and the free port areas, particularly on the fourth and in uh, around right. Inverness and Galsby, effectively removes the primary centre of our economy and takes it out and hands it over to other people, thereby making it not possible for us to genuinely say to people, independence will allow us to address the issues of social deprivation and of slowed economic growth that we suffer under the union. Because all of those things, all of those things that would give us the power and the ability to address the issues of the country are immediately taken away from us by the creation of free ports. And how anybody in the Scottish National Party could have agreed to this in any kind of a way is, is utterly and completely beyond my understanding. But here we are again in another circumstance where somebody, somebody pops up out of nowhere, is hailed in the press as being a future star. And I'm talking Kate Forbes here. She came from nowhere and suddenly she was given the, the finance brief. Suddenly she was a star. Who knows anything about her? What are her politics? Can anybody tell me what her politics are economically? We know what her, poli or what her politics are socially, and they're defined by a fundamental Christianity, and I don't have an issue with that. But where do you stand on the economy? Clearly, she takes a right-wing conservative view, or she would not have supported and written that gushing letter to Michael Gove. <coughs> One thing, finish with this. Ivan McKee, to his credit, saw this coming, challenged it, and was immediately removed from the negotiations by Nicola Sturgeon and Kate Forbes. So Ivan, well done, but it's time for you to come out and tell us the truth of what you know. Here, here. Um, Eva, you're standing in Allo and Grangemouth. You're going to be in this free port zone. 
how do you as the prospective par parliamentary member of parliament feel about the free zone and fracking in your your constituency i'm absolutely enraged and one of the reasons for it is my um own upbringing because my dad as i've spoken about before worked in the oil industry and then in crane hire and construction and he ran several offices and and um different organizations within crane hire right throughout the whole of scotland but he started off as a, a fitter on the tools and he worked at kishhorn nig ardish seer cromarty um all, all over the every part of Scotland where there was ever any oil rig construction in the 70s and then in Green Hire and other places later on. And that includes in Grangemouth and in Falkirk. And I used to work for him in the office um, in Falkirk and in Stirling and you could see the amount of buzz that there was going on. The place was busy, it was industrial um, and it was good stuff for everybody around about. There were big employers, all, all well-known Green Hire companies. And when I look at this set of circumstances now, all I can see is that the work of men like my dad from the 70s until now has been for nothing because their efforts have been forgotten. What they did in the oil industry has not benefited the people of Scotland. It's benefited those out with Scotland primarily. It's bankrolled London, as I've said so many times before. It's bankrolled you know, foreign wars, etc., bombs on the Clyde and all that stuff. But the bottom line is, that there is nothing about free ports that is positive or beneficial for the people of Scotland for all the reasons already stated and also the fact that if you have a free port in your country you're not likely to be allowed to re-enter the EU. The SNP know this and that they keep talking about getting back into the EU with independence. If free ports proceed they haven't a hope in hell of getting into the EU. Whether or not you'd want to be in the EU is something different but it, it, that it shows a level of either they're either disingenuous or they actually don't know and whichever it is is not healthy so overall completely opposed to it yes of course you can have a partnership of public and private development but what you don't do is hand over control to Westminster particularly if you're a party whose raison d'etre is to remove control from Westminster and control everything at home in Scotland. Here, here. And as I'm saying, we're now the, the public have got a problem because all the unionist parties are in favour of this because London's in favour of it. So they are, they'll do what their English masters tell them. The SNP are in favour of it. And now we have the Alpha Party bringing in a guru of the free ports. It's a worry for the people of Scotland, it really is. We have to look. Techie, I want to go next. Uh, you know, I'd like you to look at this video. Now, Stephen Flynn down at the, the House of Commons this week. Now, he said what we know. I'm going to ask you a question once you've seen this video, if I may. Techie, stick up that video of Stephen Flynn. The Conservative Party want to use Scotland's natural resources to pay for tax cuts in England. The Labour Party want to use Scotland's natural resources to pay for nuclear power stations in England. And the cost of that, up to 100,000 jobs. Scotland's wealth... Scotland's resources, Scotland's jobs, all a game to Westminster. Ian, you were in business all your life. If one of your guys came to you and said, here's a problem, Mr Lawson, you would expect him to say, and here's the solution, Mr Lawson. We know what the problem is, Ian. They've not given the, we know what the solution is, but they just don't give us the route to the solution, do they? No, well, of course, the other side do know what the solution is. And it's independence, and that's why you have all these barriers there intentionally to stop us moving in that direction. But the problem is our leader down there, uh, the chap Flynn, he's not really that serious about it. He, he can identify a problem, but he's got no idea about what he needs to do to solve that problem. And, of course, that's a much harder line than what he's prepared to take. I mean, the SNP have made a big fuss over getting badly treated over the gas, the thing, walked out for an afternoon, and they were back there the next day, you know, and everything just carried on as if nothing had happened. I mean, I think the only way that we're going to get any action out of uh, the SNP is if Jim Radcliffe insists that everybody in Grangemouth and that area where Manchester United strips to go to their work, you know, because 
he's getting away with murder, this guy. And I've seen it. I mean, I've been through all this with Ravenscraig, where Ravenscraig was profitable, where Ravenscraig was well done, run. And, and, you know, the British trade union movement sold Ravenscraig out as well because they insisted that the campaign to save Ravenscraig must be based on the five plants. In other words, you know, nobody in Scotland could say, well, you should shut one of these less efficient plants down south, you know, and keep Ravenscraig. But at the same time as that was happening, we know there was steel workers in Shotton wandering about with badges on saying, shut Ravenscraig, you know? So the British trade union movement, the British Labour Party sold out Ravenscraig. And the same's happening with Grangemouth. Where's the complaint about this? You know, we, we're the only part of the UK that, you know, produces oil in any quantity. There's hundreds of thousands of jobs. That was a mistake Sonic made last week when he said there was 400,000 jobs in the steel industry, in the oil industry. Wait, well, didn't they tell you it's 250,000 of them are south of the border? <laughs> you know, the jobs in the oil industry are in Britain, but they're not in Scotland. A lot of the highest paid, best jobs are situated down round about London in that area, down there. So, I mean, we're mugs up here. We, you know, but we're mugs only because we sit quietly while those who have, we have elected, who are supposed to defend us, don't defend us, sell us out, do deals. You know, I mean, God, we lost all that gas, uh, sorry, all the wind power. It was an action replay of the 70s. I remember, I was around in the 70s, and I remember getting told, in fact, I was in a party that was arguing that Scottish oil would only last 10 years. We were lied to. Absolutely lied to. And they're still at it. When the referendum came up in 2014, we were told it would only last, at best, maybe 10 years. But here we are 10 years later in the Labour, uh, the Tory government, are selling off licences as fast as they possibly can, you know, for new fields that are going to last 20, 30, 40 years into the future. And still we are sitting here thinking, you know, why didn't we do what Norway did? Well, I'll tell you why we never done it. Mm -hmm. Too few people took an interest in what was happening. Too few people today still take an interest in what's happening. And that's yeah. what we've got to sort out. Once we sort that out, things will happen. Yeah, but that's why it goes full circle to where we started. Grassroots need to do it because, as you say, the politicians have all got their own big pet projects, whether it be, you know, men in win wearing women's clothing or whatever. Um, you know, they're not, we're not doing it. But it goes back to this guy that's come in and the, the, the Alpha Party bringing in a guy that does wants to do free ports. Oil and gas is your game, Phil. And we've got Stephen Flynn down there saying how bad it is, and they're going to, you know, 100,000 jobs are at stake, and all this money is getting financed from Scotland. We know that independence is the key to everything. Why is your party, did I say, not giving us the solution instead of the problem? We all know the problem. We need the solution. Well, we all know what the solution is, and so do all of these people. The problem is they're doing what they're tell, they're controlled. And, you know, the when I look at this uh, at Westminster, it explains perfectly what Scotland is subsidising now. UK. Well done, articulate. Uh, I, I know Stephen, and he's an articulate and intelligent guy, but he wouldn't be where he is if he didn't do as he's tell. So it will take a clear out that we've been talking about for such a long time, a rebellion from within to oust the infected leadership and a return to the prime directive of independence, nothing else. Scotland's national resources used again and again to bolster the UK, as Thatcher did when in the you know when, when we we started producing uh, profit from oil. Now, so so Ian uh, it was right as well. I mean Stephen Flynn can jog on. Stephen Flynn and his ilk can all jog on and echo an Ian, Ian's statement. I worked on two major BG, uh, BP projects, each worth many billions of pounds over five year, four or five year periods. And 450 to 500 people, project personnel at two locations south of the border, one KBR Leatherhead and the other at Old Street in London. And uh, 
so all of these jobs that are down there, predominantly folk from England. The Scotland has had used to have the majority of oil workers. When we ha we had many, we, the, the numbers are it's not the top of my head just now, but I used to uh, used to be able to run them off all the time. Um, it is in decline, massive decline, badly managed, and everything's been moved south now. Even the refineries going to be removed uh, left in, in in England, even though ninety six and a half percent of the oils in Scottish waters, an absolute disgrace. Oh, and sixty five percent the gra the gas, and both figures are set to stay the same, a rise, probably rise, because most new findings are going to be in uh, west off offshore, west of Shetland and beyond, all the way around in Northern Ireland waters. Yeah. Right. Ian, you should know you've been in the, the independence movement long enough to go. You don't leave the middle of a meeting. You have been elected treasurer and secretary of the group well, in your absence. You know, you know that's the rules. That's a true story. When I joined the SNP, it was nine months of doing AGMs before I, I, I was ever at one where the treasurer that was elected was actually at the meeting. <laughs> yeah. Don't leave the room, mate. You've been, I'll send you through your brief later. Well, well, as you know, I've got to go shortly, so I'm just organising, getting my shoes organised and Good. stuff, you know. Well, type the clock is beating us all. We're, we're, we're cracking on here. Um, Lloyd, Stephen Flynn knows the problem, didn't give us a solution. Oh, an awkward. Okay, pound all you. <laughs> Stephen Flynn's an actor. I've worked with enough of them to see it. And he may well be intelligent and he may well be articulate. In fact, he is articulate. But he's got that cosy mattress to fall on if he falls off the ledge at <laughs> Westminster of knowing that he's got backup and support. And I don't mean from the membership of the Scottish National Party. Stephen Flynn's been tapped on the shoulder. He thinks his job is to take a rise out of the, the Prime Minister of Britain every Tuesday or Wednesday, whenever they, they do it in that stupid place. He thinks making smart remarks is politics, and it's not. I don't know the leader of an independence movement anywhere in the world who, when confronted with, name us, the major reason why you should be independent they don't say it automatically. <coughs> they have the figures in their head, they have the argument, and at every opportunity, what they do is they present those figures and they present that argument. I'll give you a, you know, here's a, here's, a, here's a wee thing to think about. Yesterday, I'm in a taxi, taxi drivers ranting on about the state of the country and everything, and I say, well, you know, you know what the answer is. Aye, well, those that say independence, you know what I mean, but we're the only oil producing country that's not going to have an oil refinery. Anyway, we always forget that, don't we? That was a great campaign for years and years, and it was right in the forefront of people's minds. It's Scotland's oil. It's Scotland's oil. We need to get back to that. In the same way as in the back of the minds of people of this country, they know that the SNP stands for independence. Unfortunately, like us, they don't know that this bunch of imposters don't stand for independence. But anybody who goes out there and says it's Scotland's oil, that will resonate and it will resonate again as it did before. Because when you trigger that, people remember the truth. Because oddly enough, when the leaders of our parties can't remember that, the taxi driver in Edinburgh can, it's Scotland's oil. Scotland is a rich country. And when our leaders start saying these things, instead of pandering and playing to the rules of the Palace of Westminster, then they will maybe get their parties back on, you know, back on track. But at the moment, it's for us as the people to say, it's Scotland's oil. Yeah, absolutely. Eva, you're taking that step because you know the solution. Stephen Flynn maybe knows the problem, but he doesn't know the solution. You know the solution. Yeah, well, I was a bit heartened, actually, when I read that Keith Brown had been talking about the SNP having to withdraw from Westminster, and then he was immediately... Um, I suppose, rebuked and reminded that that's not their policy at all. So I don't know what the SNP think they're doing, but I would like to think that the result of the by-election in, I think it was Hillhead in Glasgow, yeah, they yeah. will have an impact on them because obviously the Greens won it, although most first preferences went to the SNP. So I really hope that the SNP get their act together and realise that A, the Greens are not actually an independent supporting party for reasons previously stated, 
that the Greens have brought the SNP's reputation very far down, much lower than it might otherwise have been, as the result of all the mental policies that we know they've, they've pursued here. But if you look at the bigger picture, everybody knows that the argument is no longer should Scotland be independent. We know that Scotland cannot afford to remain part of the United Kingdom because we will be we will continue to be bled dry. You know, Grace Peter said they did not colonise us so that they could subsidise us, and that's exactly the point. The reason that Scotland is not independent is because Scotland is the cash cow. The SNP and Alba and the ISP and all independents for independence need to get together and hammer out an agreement as to the, the route map to independence. It starts with a citizens' convention or a constitutional convention and an alliance between all true independence supporting candidates. And some current SNP MPs are known not to be so, and they ought not to stand for election again. And Stephen Flynn and Hamza Youssef and Kate Forbes and Joanna Cherry too, please, should sit down sensibly with all other leaders and talk about making this general election the independence election. There is no reason why not. Have a common strap line, vote for me, it's a vote for independence, make it plain, straightforward and simple. And when there is a majority of MPs, majority of the popular vote, that's a mandate, as I said before, to negotiate the settlement. That's the way to do it. Indeed. I know you're going to say something about a convention. I know you're not going to miss your opportunity, Ian. But what I want to just say, if you could, Techie, could you stick up the thing about Mr Harvey and the Greens' latest initiative? I don't know if you saw this one, Ian. Uh, Patrick Harvey, this is the Scottish Government's own advisory committee looked at Patrick Harvey's, and you were surprised to hear, Ian, yet another idea or policy of the Green Party is a farce, won't work, won't is not costed properly, and it just is not feasible. Um, it's quite, quite, I mean, is there anything they've done that actually works here? Well, I think the, the, the funny thing about that is that hill head by election that the Greens won, only because of the very dubious system of election we have, uh, with swap votes, etc. over the thing. But, I mean, that policy has the heat pumps. I've yet to hear of any tenement anywhere where heat pumps are an economic solution to their heating problem. And that whole constituency in Hillhead is full of tenements, as is most yeah. of Scotland. So heat pumps are out the window. Air pumps, which is the, another alternative, they're not very good. And they don't work very well in Scotland because we have quite a variance in uh, our temperatures. You know, no, so shit. it's quite hard to say that <laughs> Well, it's quite hard to set it at the right level. But, I mean, it's another example of just green policies that are nonsensical. I mean, I actually had a big article of this on my blog months ago. And at the time, I'm off to do some research. And I contacted Scottish Gas to ask them about green hydrogen or hydrogen because that's very soon going to be available. And what most people probably don't know is that for years now, the boilers we've been putting, the gas boilers we've been putting in our homes with a very, very small adjustment can be converted over to hydrogen very inexpensively. So here's this idiot Harvey wanting to get people spending huge sums of money, you know, and for an inferior heating system where just by some slight modifications to current existing boilers, you can convert over to a greener fuel hydrogen when it becomes available and they're talking about that in the next four or five years uh, as being the dominant fuel so we don't need Patrick Harvey's silly ideas we don't need these the Greens bottle deposit scheme you know which cost industry huge sums of money and never happened you know they're pie in the sky politicians and they're doing great damage you know to the SNP some may argue that doesn't make them all bad but I mean it would be better for Scotland if they were constructive and actually putting forward ideas that were genuinely green and helpful. You know, boring things like proper insulation. 
Yeah. You'll do more to cut energy output, but properly ins uh, insulating their homes than we'll ever do with any of these DAF schemes. Mm -hmm. uh, and just a fact, Phil, if this was your business and you had a partner, could, I mean, I, 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 I might be wrong, it might even be more, I hear something like the, the bottle return scheme costs the Scottish Government 86 million quid or something, something ridiculous like that. Um, if they kept making these mistakes that were costing so much money, you would, you would fire them. Instead, they fire Fergus Ewing. Aye, it's it's absolutely nonsense. It's um, it, it's ridiculous when you think about it. And following on what Ian was mentioning earlier, um, on green and blue hydrogen, the the, the two types of low emission hydrogen that differ in their production methods, right? So the uh, and their environmental impacts, because that's obviously and that's why we're using the term green. So green is you split water into hydrogen and oxygen using renewable energy, but was blue hydrogen is is, is different. You know uh, that the the blue hydrogen is um, from fossil fuels and and uses carbon capture, which is something I've got some expertise or, or significant experience in. Would call myself an expert. You want to talk to the expert? Talk to a professor. Uh, Stuart Hazeldean at Aberdeen uh, Edinburgh University, who's the first prof professor on this subject. But anyway, no, it's uh, it's crazy when you look at what's going on with these these clowns, these um these idiots. You know, um, I, I, all all you can see is Patrick Harvey continuing to make stupid mistakes, and the Greens wasting yet more and more money. And you've just got to say, well, when will this end? And the answer is it won't. These guys are absolutely useless. They're mm -hmm. absolutely useless. So mm -hmm. I've got absolutely no hope that they will ever find a solution to this. Um, anything. The Greens should be should not be in power. They've proven that they're incompetent and we need red. And we should have got rid of them a long time ago. And it's just, it's just it's, it's one debacle, one mess after another and uh, it's, it's it's ridiculous and patrick i mean the, the thing is the 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 one other thing is the one the policy they do have right though the greens is the one where the green tail wags the yellow dog in the direction of the collectors the collective master's voice mi5 and the 77th brigade because that policy seems to be working very well and even the, yeah. the daily express which i don't really see it, it, he's detached from reality the guy hasn't got a clue Oh, you you. Listen, we're running out of time. I know Ian's running out of time, so I want to get a couple of quick topics in before we go a couple of minutes, guys. Um, the budget this week, Lloyd, now a couple of things I want to throw in. The first one is that they've cut national insurance again. Now, for the national insurance, for anyone that doesn't know, that pays out pensions and, and other uh, welfare payments, and they keep cutting it back. Is this them lining us up to get rid of the welfare state completely? Yes, of course, because that's the, the ideological drive of the current Tory front bench and their backers from the, the back benches. Um, it's, it, we're in an extraordinary situation here where, but, but you know, let's, uh, let's give them the applause they deserve. The Tories have come out the cupboard and decided that they've nothing to lose with a straightforward, straightforward attack on the poor people of this country. Um, there's there's nothing in this budget for that's that's going to alleviate, alleviate poverty in any way whatsoever for the people in Scotland and indeed there's a number of issues that could well increase poverty by mm -hmm. by by quite a bit but I think this is a government that is so completely ideologically captured with its own with its own ideology which they know is not popular that they're trying to find ways to uh, by stealth achieve their aims, but in their aims ultimately are to remove the welfare state in all its forms uh, and to have effectively corporatism in the country. And if people don't wake up to, but I think people have woken up, you know, let's, let's be honest here. What's happened in England the past couple of weeks, and it's not just because it was George Galloway. If it hadn't been George Galloway, it would have been the local businessman who came second with twice the votes of all the other full-scale British parties in that election in Rochdale. So, you know, as you've said yourself, the worm is turning, and that's a great thing. But the Tories are ideologically captured by their own prejudice. They loathe and despise people they they perceive 
not to be successful. And their terms of success are the success that can only be achieved by stamping on other people's faces on the way up that ladder. Correct. And on another one, quickly on that budget, Techie, can you stick up the thing about uh, the levelling up money? Now, they're, they're saying there's £300 million pounds for Scotland. It sounds a lot. To the ordinary punter, I think, so we're getting £300 million. But if you look down at the bottom one, Eva, Canary Wharf is getting £242 million and It's a part of London. Now, someone else did a, a breakdown of that. It works out, the £300 million works out like 55 quid for every man, woman and child in Scotland. The, 30, the 242 million in Canary Wharf, which is for a population of 17,000, a part of London, works out at 17 or 20 grand each or something. It kind of just sums up how we are, but we're not a colony. No, 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 no we're not a colony. I think I might just print that out and put it on the front page of my manifesto. There you go. Yeah, the penny might drop at that stage. We are a net exporter of energy. We are a wealthy country in terms of all of our resources. Our money goes south to Westminster and the Exchequer decides how much we get back again for pocket money and we get back a fraction of what we contribute. Everybody knows that. That's why I said earlier we remain part of the union. So all that that exercise proves is what is already known. Scotland subsidises the UK. There is no doubt about it. But the UK Exchequer decides every now and again when to stick a wee bit extra out here and there. It's insulting, it's offensive, and the reason why this continues is because despite the fact that there's a 53% majority support for independence, we have not elected politicians with the leadership that had courage and had guts and had the guile and the ambition and the vision to actually deliver independence. And that's what's needed this year more than any other, because what we see now is only going to get worse, whether it's a Tory government or a Labour government, there is nothing to choose between them. Labour are not the socialists of the wealth by any stretch of the imagination. Rachel Reeves has proven that again this week. So the quicker Scotland gets its act together, and gets the hell out of there, the better for all. The last, on those two points, uh, Ian, and the last one, Techie, stick up Rachel Reeves. Now, if you didn't know this was, a, this is meant to be a Labour future Chancellor of the Labour Party. Let's be specific. What would you have done differently? So what we need is a plan for growth. We need to get people back to work. There are 700,000 more people um, are due to be on sickness benefits. Uh, and that, of course, is a huge cost to the economy with the benefits paid out, but also the huge loss in terms of what they could be contributing. Uh, so we need to be getting people back to work. <laughs> it could be a Tory. You, if you'd been away for 10 years and you come back, you wouldn't know that was a Labour person, would you, she would be described as a right winger in Ted Heath's government, you know, without, without any question. I mean, the one thing the budget that stuck out for me was the anti-Scottish air passenger duty. They put up domestic a APD. The only people that pay that tax are Scots. The vast majority, nobody in the south of England pays that because they all live near an airport. The three major late, uh, airports in London cover all, them all down there. Likewise, yeah. in the centre of England, you've got Manchester, which flies all over the world. So mm -hmm. that domestic passenger duty is only paid by Scots, who, you mm -hmm. know, they keep our airports and the number of direct flights restricted and forces to fly down to London to catch, you know, more long distance flights. Yeah. So, you know, it's just another measure that you would never have in an independent Scotland. You know, we wouldn't penalise our own people, you know. We pay twice. We pay the domestic and then we pay the international. The English pay the international. It's an absolute rip-off. But yeah, again, we go along with it all the time. They're now up to, I think it's £5 to drop a passenger at Glasgow Airport. Oh, you know, to drop, okay. You're bringing them customers and you're paying for the privilege of doing it. It's ridiculous. Tell me about it. I'm flying back on the... Uh, as you're watching this, folks, I'm already back in Scotland. There you go. Probably having a, a sausage, square, a square sausage, thought he's going an egg roll. Morton's roll, of course, while you're watching this.
Um, and I'm going to repeat it. That's just in what you said, Ian. When I was flying back, I was looking, I can fly to London when I'm going when I'm coming back here for 22 quid. But it's 220 quid to get to Barcelona yeah, from Glasgow. What? From Glasgow. Aye. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Um, so those last questions, the budget, 300 million yeah. for Scotland, 242 million for, for the Canary War, the national insurance stripping away. It's the third cut, incidentally, and the Tories have done recently. I'd see us out, Phil. Well, it's propaganda. It's exactly opposite of levelling up. It's what they do. They continue asset strip. It's greed. So the budget for Scotland is £35 billion. So the extra under the Barnet consequential stated is actually £295 million, which is less than 1% of the Scottish of the budget that we get back in. Now, whilst inflation is over 4%, now, it was over 10% last year. So this is no biggie, if you understand the figures, and especially, as Eve alluded to earlier, of what Scotland pays in in tax versus the, the small, much smaller amount that we get back, um, which is a return on... So we're given some of our tax to spend. Mind you, and, and this is critical, we are the only part of the UK with a positive balance of trade. So we can actually trade our way out of a recession, something that the rest of the UK and most of Europe now cannot do. On the national insurance, check out what um, Martin Lewis's warning was. Most will be worse off despite the national insurance cut. Now, he says million, millions of, of Brits will be because this, this is Jeremy Hunt announced that the national insurance would be cut by two pence from April 6th. The councillor said it would move benefit, uh, would, would benefit around 27 million workers with the average person saving 450 quid. Second national insurance cut, as you mentioned, from 12% to 10%. But what Martin Lewis said uh, in a response to the budget on uh, the moneysavingexpert.com place that he founded, he noted that due to the frozen tax bans, many would not see the benefit. In a post on the MSE website, he said, what freezing the threshold does is that it means that no matter what you earn, as your earnings increase, a bigger proportion of your earnings goes on tax. And that's how the Chancellor makes money from it. So again, just the government and their tax advisors scamming you. And it doesn't matter who's doing it. If it's Conservative, New Labour, it doesn't matter who you vote for. Same outcome, two cheeks of the same arse, arse both removing the welfare state and destroying it. And that's the ultimate idea. Here, as always, we've come the clock beats us as it does every time. And don't get through all the things I want to talk about. So thank you. Thank you all for being here. Ian, nice to see you back. Thank you for your input. I know you're desperate to get to the pub. Uh, sorry, I to, your, I to your drink. church meeting. Your church meeting. Sorry, your church meeting. Yeah, no, no, I don't even drink. I'm just got to get people that do drink to the pub in town. I know, I know. That old, you have I know. no idea that, the flack I'm going to get from being late. But never uh, that old chestnut. I don't really drink. I'm being forced. I know. I'm the same. I'm the same. Um, but I want to thank you very much for being here. We we'll hope to get you back again soon. But also, folks, remember you've seen one. Hour. We're going to be going this time and uh, next Friday. We'll be in Dundee in the Queen's Hotel. Come along. Live show, ask your questions, meet us after. I'm sure we'll all be in the bar. I'm sure that's a certainty. Um, and there'll be other dates that we're putting up. There it is, uh, next Friday in Dundee. We're also going to be going to Grangemouth. You'll be surprised to hear. We're also going to Perth. You'll be surprised to hear. We're also probably going to Aberdeen. Just waiting on a phone call. That'll get that's them like. scurrying. Well, no, we are. I think we're going to Aberdeen. We're being uh, approached. Um, we're going to Aberdeen, and I've missed one. Eva, who have I missed? I've missed somewhere, I can't remember. Oh, Dunfermline, who could I forget? We're going to where they've buried the King Robert the Bruce, uh, and we're going there, um, and all those dates will be revealed next week. But thank you, thank you for watching, thank you for being here, and until I see you and my friends here see you, you and yours, please, please, take care. Through a Scottish Prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish Prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy.